dedicated to geeks and nerds, you're listening to Project I Radio, 24-7, Nerdcastle. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f- What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f- Brian Keane was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back to The Horror Show, brought to you by Project I Radio. I'm your host, Brian Keene. Dave is on vacation this week. He's off celebrating his birthday by hunting whales or something like that. But I'm pleased to announce that sitting in for him is a very special guest. Oh, well, I'm special. You Education are, isn't everything. You I'm are special. special. Yeah, that's right. He's the author of Retribution Incorporated, Answers of Silence, and with me, Shades. He's also a model rocket enthusiast. And he saves lives full-time as a paramedic. And despite the fact that I often want to throttle the fuck out of him, he's one of my best friends. The feeling is mutual. Please welcome Jeff Cooper. Greetings and salivations. <laughs> I'm regretting this already. I bet. <laughs> I should mention that today's episode is brought to you by Brian Smith's Crime Spree Bundle. Exclusive to Kindle, the Crime Spree Bundle collects three Brian Smith books for less than the price of one. It includes The Killing Kind, a story about a sexy serial killer Roxy's multi-state killing spree. 68 Kill, a wild pulse-pounding tale of a man lured into a seemingly easy scheme to swipe $68,000 that of course goes horrifyingly wrong. And Blood and Whiskey, about a man who inadvertently witnesses the aftermath of a bloody crime while trying to check up on his estranged wife. All three books are included in Brian Smith's Crime Spree Bundle, available now on Kindle for just $3.99. Three ninety nine for Brian Smith. That's some... For three Brian Smith novels. No, I was saying three three ninety nine for one. I'd be I'd be down with that, but no, that's a, that's a hell of a deal. Anybody Absolutely. that doesn't take you know doesn't take advantage of that is well, they've got issues. Uh, I would agree. I, I would agree. I, I think uh, out of out of all the authors working today, I think Smith comes the closest to capturing that Richard Lehman magic, which we're going to talk about later in the show. Um, if people haven't tried him and they're Richard Lehman fans, I, I think they should try him out. I, I, I would, uh, I would say that he taps the same kind of vein. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Now, Coop, I don't know if you've been listening to the show or not, but uh, you have a show. We have a show. No shit. What did you think we were doing here? Just playing radio station? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mentioned last week that the show is a hit. Uh, with that, lots of folks are inquiring about advertising. Uh, if you'd like to be a sponsor, please contact Jesse at Project iRadio. That's J-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E. Uh, he'll work out a package that will fit your budget. And if you got a question or a comment about the show, hit us up on Twitter at The Horror Show BK or online at The Horror Show with Brian .com. Valentine's Day, which was last weekend, I believe. Yeah, it was Saturday. Yeah, did, Saturday. Did you, did you get your significant other a Valentine's Day card? I did. Good for you. I did. Good for you. And we had a we had a wonderful Valentine's Day. We got the kids. You know, there was a, a whole bunch of candy devoured, and there was like these little robots where you put candy in their heads, you wind them up, and they walk across the table pooping candy as they went. It pooping candy. It was fantastic. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I Valentine's Day is always mixed for me. Uh, because it is, of course, the anniversary of Richard Lehman's death. It, yes. Uh, this year was the 14th anniversary. Now, 
It goes without saying that Dick was one of the most influential and best-selling horror authors of his generation. Indeed, he used to regularly outsell both Stephen King and Dean Kuntz in England and Germany. Sadly, he never reached that level here in the States until after his death. But more personally, he was a friend and mentor to you and I and a lot of our friends, so I thought it might be fun for us to reflect on that and share some personal anecdotes this week and talk about how he influenced us. But before we get to that, we're going to cover the news. And before we cover the news, I want to mention, folks, if you can hear train whistles right now at home, we apologize. We are we are not recording this in my kitchen this weekend. We're, we're trying a different location. Yeah. And uh, it's between two train tracks. I, I'm not sure what made me think that this would be an ideal location. but I'm not so sure that you were thinking. Yeah, well, this is par for the course. Well, yeah. But, have I mentioned I'm regretting this already? <laughs> Hold on. I'll start caring real soon. Check your give a fuck meter. It's dead. It's dead? Okay. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna try to get through with the trains anyway. Next week we are recording in an official professional grade sound studio, so that yeah. should be a lot better. Wow. It's like the train is coming right through the place. Eh, you get used to Can it. Can you hear this, folks? I'm holding the microphone up to the window now. That's right. We're being attacked by Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> he's he's pooping candy <laughs> along the track. <laughs> All right. Well, unfortunately, Coop, we start with some sad news. Uh, last week, we reported that author Melanie Thames' cancer had gotten worse. Yeah. Um, she had developed breast cancer back in 97. Two years ago, it recurred and, and metastasized elsewhere. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to report she passed away last Monday, the 9th. Um, she survived, of course, by her husband, author Stephen Rasnick Tem, their four children, six grandchildren, and a dedicated readership. Folks, if you haven't read her work, my personal favorites are Prodigal and The Wilding. Oh, uh, Prodigal was awesome. Prodigal was incredible. Oh, I love that one. One hell of a debut novel. Um, she's also got a new collection coming out later this year called Singularities. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, she did pass, mm -hmm. and so this episode is dedicated to her. Also last week, we talked about how it's Women in Horror Month once again, and we discussed with guest Kelly Owen about the fact that Given the horror genre's stellar record of diversity, whether we still needed a Women in Horror Month. Hmm. Uh, okay. Let me ask you this. Do you remember, now you, you have been at this as long as I have. We've been doing this almost 20 years now. Oh do God, you, it is about that long, isn't it? Yeah. Do you remember a guy named Rod Labby or Lab or Labby, L-A-B-B-E? Yeah, how do you how how do you pronounce his last name? I, I don't think we ever learned I, how to pronounce his last name. I always kind of went with Lab. Yeah, I I mean he was around back when, as you say, when Moby Dick was a minnow. Yeah, no, we're talking. This had to be late nineties, maybe early oh maybe two thousand. Yeah, you were still a member of HWA. That that tells me how oh, long. Oh Christ, no, that was that was. I think I was. I gave HWA what one year, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah you it. you promised Dick Lehman that you yeah, would join no, I, when yeah, he became I told president. Yeah, I'd do it for a year, and then and then no, I could I couldn't do it. <laughs> well, he was he was HWA member back then, and yeah, I think, I think you and I tangled with them. Nick Mamatas tangled with them. Mike Oliveri, JF Gonzalez, many others. Uh, what I remember is that he was a sexist, transphobic, bullying bag of wind with the manners and grace of a rabid wombat, and as inconsequential as a spastic fucking titsy fly. Is that how you remember him? Well, yeah, uh, more or less. I mean, it it took me a moment, but this is the same nitwit that publicly challenged me to a fight. He is indeed. Not that he's the only one that's ever done that, but no, yeah, 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 no, yeah. that was the. This is the same. Did yeah. he write for like a weightlifting he, fucking magazine? He or was something? a he was a freelancer. He wrote for weightlifting magazines, <clears throat> Fangoria, a couple articles in Fangoria, but yeah, he was all those things. And yeah, so what 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 did this stellar piece of humanity 
Dude, why, why is he news? <laughs> why are we talking about him yeah. during Women in Horror Month? Yeah, Women in Horror Month, Dick Lehman, and we're sitting here talking about some Rod, some guy who may or may not be labia. Well, he he is the reason can why... Can we call him Rod Labia? I think we should. We can. If, I call him douchebag, but you can call him whatever you want. I thought douchebag was already... Like, with a capital D, I'm pretty sure that was already taken. Well, I, there's so many. So many trolls, so little time, and you and I have clubbed them is, like is baby this, seals. Would this be but... a, like a pseudonym for uh, Nicholas Pachione? No. No. No, it's, no. Are we sure it's a different guy? This uh, this guy makes Pachione look coherent. Oh, get the fuck out. Well, <laughs> truthfully, I, I'd forgotten all about this guy. I mean, I well, years ago, a, years I mean, ago... You know, that was a long time. I had hoped he'd driven into the back of a garbage truck by now, but no such luck. Uh, he has a book coming out from oh, the you... otherwise stellar Sam Hain Publishing. And so he's back, and he's back to spouting nonsense online. Earlier this week, he posted that most female horror writers, quote, look like hags, end quote. He went on to say that they, quote, wear mysterious costumes to make themselves look like bargain basement Stevie Nicks and to look like flower children with an expiration date of 1969, ghoulish makeup that would make Elvira look like a lesson in understatement and hair that looks like a cheap <laughs> perm gone bad. Oh, wait, it gets better. He went on to say, they wear lace gloves without fingers, lots of bangles, and dabble in witchcraft on the side. <laughs> okay. That, oh, no, no, wait. That is what women horror writers look like nowadays. Never mind that the actual work of these people sucks. End quote. And that is why we're talking about Rob Lab or Labe. And that, my friend, is why we still need a Women in Horror Month. Well, you know that's that's uh, that's an interesting take on the on the many women you know in horror. And I, I'm kind of flabbergasted, really. I mean, for me, that's that's saying something. But uh, I'm I'm wondering. Does he have something new coming out? I mean, is this is this like a like a ploy to hey, there is no such thing as bad press, so I'm just gonna act like a fucking major douche rocket to try to get some interest in my name, and maybe that'll kind of push my book. Maybe, unfortunately, like I said, you know, he's he's got publishing credits with Fangoria. Now he's with Sam Hain. Now I know the folks that run both Fangoria and Sam Hain. They're good people. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm sure he doesn't do this with their, you know, I, I'm he he wouldn't be doing that. No, with you know Sam Haynes, you know, knowledge or blessing. There's a, this is going to be no Don, a, Don Dario would drop him like a, a a hot turd if if he had knowledge of that. You know, so I'm sure he doesn't speak for the publisher. No. Uh, nor, it doesn't exactly nor does he reflect speak for well on the publisher, but no. I'm sure he doesn't speak for them. No. No, I. That's uh, that's an interesting take, Mister Mister Lab. If you're out there in Podland, and being as the FCC is not looking over our shoulder, may I be the first to say on the air, "Fuck you." I agree. I concur. <laughs> you fucking dick bag. Now, you know, I, I wonder how many, like, how long did you work on that little uh, tirade there? Because, you know, really, there is going off, there's being pissed off, and then there's just showing off, okay? Which one was he doing? Oh, that was show off. That was show off. That was, that was a lesson in how many negative impressions I can get into one sentence is all the fuck that was. That was a less of, you know, nobody cares about his opinion on the women of horror, so he's going to sit here and craft this fantastic rant so they will talk about his rants. That's that's what that obviously is. It's transparent, it's bullshit, and you're a bag of dicks! Well, and I, I would agree, you are a bag of dicks, Rob. And, Jesus and fucking Christ! I would concur with my esteemed colleague uh, when he says to fuck You hear you. that, bitches? I'm esteemed. 
Uh, I should point out, I did not reach out to Fangoria or Samhain uh, before we went on the air, because as you said, it's it's not something he said. Obviously, they don't share his sentiments, but I will say, Tony, Don, Chris, uh, if any of you would like to comment, you know how to get a hold of me, and uh, we'll air your comments next week. Mm-hmm. Well, let's get to something a little more positive. Okay. Um, because it is Women in Horror Month, last week, Dave and I recommended five horror novels by five female writers that we thought everyone should read. Mm. I'd mentioned that in compiling my list, I'd come up with over 200 professional female horror writers working in the business now, and that I would list another five this week, and at the end of the month, I'd put the whole 200 up on the website. So, okay. here's my list for this week. Uh, Let's Play White by Cheshire Burke. Uh, this this is a short story collection. It's sort of a cross between horror and magic realism. Very, very diverse themes and subject matter. Mm-hmm. It is an outstanding debut, and that is available right now in paperback and Kindle. I've, I've always liked Chesha. I thought she... Uh... You know, not just as a as a writer. I thought she was, you know, very cool. Oh, she's I, a great person. Yeah, no, I've... She does not put up with shit from either of us no, over the years. No, she does we have... not, and that <laughs> always kind of makes me giggle. Oh, yeah. Uh, number two is Suffer the Flesh by Monica J. O'Rourke. Now, last week, Kelly said that when people approach her at signings, they wonder why she's not writing romance novels. What then must they think of Monica, who writes some of the most extreme of extreme horror ever? I mean, she stands side by side with Edward Lee and Rath James White. In fact, I, I think she's outdone Lee with her new novel. Mm, but but I, would, Monica, I would start with Suffer the Flesh, which paperback and Kindle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would put Monica up there kind of the same lines as uh, Charlie Jacob. Absolutely. and Same, uh, same kind of, you know, I think that they would probably, that they probably do share a, uh, you know, a, Big swath across their audience, you know, with I, reading both. I think Monica. If they're not, they should be. I think Monica's probably a little more unflinching than Charlie Jacob. Or she can be. Mm, okay. And she's also uh, like Cheshire. She's another one who is has never taken our shit. So. No, she takes great delight in not taking our yeah. shit. <laughs> and I hear you out there shaking your head from here. <laughs> Third up on this week's list is Haunt by Laura Lee Barr. Uh, Laura was a protege of John Skip, and it shows gloriously in this debut novel. It's part supernatural horror, part murder mystery, and part bizarro. It's very much in the vein of House of Leaves. So if you like oh. House of Leaves, yeah. you're going to like Haunt. I should also note that Laura has beat me at a rap battle three years in a row now. Okay. It's kind of our little thing that we do. Uh, that is available in paperback and Kindle. I think I think that we should YouTube that next time. I I think anybody at Bizarro Con that that films I think that, that, that is be... is forgetting that what happens at Bizarro Con stays at Bizarro Con. And I think that you know, epic rap battles of history is like the number one YouTube channel right now. I think that you guys should branch out. So instead of doing this podcast every week, Laura, Lee Barr, and I should just go on tour? And, and I'm rap. not saying not do the podcast. I'm saying branch out. I'm saying do both. All right. Well, we'll look into that, and we'll, we'll see if she's available. <laughs> <laughs> right now, Laura's changing her email address and phone number. <laughs> number four this week is Grindhouse by Alex DeCampi. Now, this is a graphic novel. Uh, it's a graphic novel that collects two separate stories. The first story is Be Vixens from Mars, which is as gloriously campy as it sounds. I, I love the title. Yeah. That, sound, that sounds like a B movie. That sounds like a lot of fun. And it, it is fun. Uh, the second story I actually preferred more. The second story is called Prison Ship and Terry's. And uh, it's similar to Kelly Sue DeConnick's Bitch Planet, except that this came first. And for my money, it's the superior of the two. Bitch Planet is a little too on the nose for me with its politics. I much prefer to Alex DeCampi's take on it. Uh, Grindhouse is available in paperback and Kindle. And finally, number five on this week's list, There's No Happy Ending by Tiffany Scandal. Now, this is straight-up bizarro fiction. I've always felt that bizarro often crosses boundaries with horror and other genres, and this one does. It's bittersweet, it's bleak, 
and sometimes humorous. It's a love story set in a post-apocalyptic world where everything is dissolving, melting, or rotting away, including our love, Coop. Well, yes. Yes. I, I could think of no better descriptor for the love that I have for you. Than, than rotting away? Other than melting and rotting away. I have put my disease in you. <laughs> So how, how about you? You have any uh, you have any recommendations? Well, as far as specific works, I would I would try to shy away from specific works because you know um, between the you know working as a paramedic in Harrisburg and you know the rockets and all that stuff, I've I've not been reading as much as I should be. Right. But as far as women working in horror, you know, women whose works that I have long respected, aside from, you know, uh, Melanie Tem, the prodigal, which was already mentioned, we already mentioned that kind of in the yep. get-go, I would say my number one would be, and this shouldn't be a surprise to those of you guys that know me, but would be Lucy Taylor's uh, Safety of Unknown Cities. Fantastic book. One of my all-time favorite books period um and it i i couldn't tell you how many times i've read this you know in my flights across the country and back and there's something about the uh, the main character you know in in her quest that uh, definitely resonated with me absolutely i i remember <laughs> I think it was 99, World Horror Convention 1999. Uh, I, I had not read the book, and I think I was down to like my last 50 bucks, and there was a dealer who had a, a signed limited edition of it for 50 bucks. The dark side edition. Yeah, and you made me buy it. <laughs> and, and I'm like, no, I'm down to my last 50 bucks. Fuck you. You're buying this. So I did, and uh, I read it on the plane ride home, and yeah, just phenomenal. Now I know there was a there was a paperback version out. Um, it may be it may be tough to find. You know? I, and no, that, and I this is why I'm loath right. to recommend specific works. But uh, suffice to say that Lucy Taylor's Safety of Unknown Cities would be you know aside from Prodigal, uh, Safety of Unknown Cities if you can find that in any form. I'm pretty sure it's on Kindle. If not, then Crossroads Press or somebody needs to pick it up and, and change that right yeah, now. Yeah, no, that needs to be fixed. But, if it's not in a in not in a freely available edition, it needs to be. Uh, as far as uh, other women authors that I would recommend, I would say uh, Mahito Bell Wilson. Uh, her uh, collection, Dangerous Red. We talked about that last week, as a matter of yes. fact. Yes, and you know another. Well, consider this another vote for that because Bell can outright just about anybody I know. Yep. When she goes and when she starts hitting on all eight, and you know she she's letting it fly. I compared it, her last last week to to David Scow. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean I, her her writing can hurt. hurt you. It's so good. Yeah, uh, you know. Uh, let's see. Uh, we could say with so many. There's so many out there. Um, Angela and Hawks, Craig. Yes, absolutely. Would definitely, you know, anybody that has not looked into her work or has somehow overlooked it needs to that should be corrected you know post haste absolutely and uh though she you know it, rain doesn't write much in the way you know of uh long fiction rain graves yeah she she's, you know, she's doing more prose these days but she's still you know, known for poetry you know, that's what i'm saying i yeah. mean she's primarily known as a poet but uh rain graves you know, rain and I have been, you know, friends, you know, good friends for a long, long time. You know, just about as long as I've known Brian. And um, I, I couldn't recommend her work highly enough. Agreed. You know, I think that uh, it may be a bit of a departure from that which, uh, you know, it, it's not... It's not like Monica. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not going to be like reading Monica or... Uh, you know, or uh, Charlie, you know, for that matter. But it, 
everybody, I would think, would do themselves well to experience. I agree. Well, after last week's show, author Ryan Harding wrote in with uh, a recommendation of his own. He writes, Dear Keen, Barbie Wild, and the name is spelled Barbie, like the doll, Wild, W-I-L-D-E. The Venus Complex would be a good one to mention on the show this month. It's a pretty dark and brutal book. Now, folks, when the author of Genital Grinder uh, calls something dark and brutal, I, yeah, I was, there you go. You guys couldn't see the uh, the facial expressions and gestures between us, but I assure you, uh, when you know Ryan Harding is recommending something, it is uh, most likely going to be so far over the top you would need well the space shuttle to actually go and retrieve it. yeah definitely not safe for work and uh coincidentally barbie is uh the female cenobite in hellraiser 2 no shit so yeah barbie wild the venus complex and thanks ryan for that um in other news the big screen adaptation of the twilight fan fiction novel turned best-selling erotica 50 shades of gray dominated the box office this past weekend. You see what I did there? Yeah, I did. Dominated. I did. I did. Now, Dominated. Coop, I may be I, wrong, but now, I, I think the last time you actually saw a movie in the theater was you and I uh, went on a double date. We took our, our partners at the time to see 28 Days Later. That, that and is you, absolutely the last you, time you, I set foot in the movie theater. You stood up 20 minutes into the movie said not only to me, not only to our dates, but to the entire theater, I've already read Simon Clark's Blood Crazy. He didn't see a dime for this. I'll be outside smoking and left. Well, while true, I did come back in after a couple of cigarettes. So, I mean, okay. I, I went out, I did come back in, and I saw, you know, I didn't commit myself to the movie because... Well, I've already read The Stand of Blood Crazy. I've seen the dead movies. We sure as fuck didn't need that. And, and, and that I, was the last time. That, that, was, was, the that last, was the last time. So it's, Any, Well, it's, no. No. No, it is not. Um, I did go up to New York, and I w did see the uh, premiere of Rip House 151. Could you, have been some wannabes. You are in Rip House 151, are you not? I, I was. Oh, okay. So... <clears throat> You know, I mean, that was like kind of like, uh, you know, part of the job. Right. You know, but uh, that I would have, you know, went and seen anyway. So is it safe to assume that you did not go see Fifty Shades of Grey this past weekend? It is perfectly safe to assume that I did not see Fifty Shades of Grey. That is absolutely correct. Do you have any thoughts on the phenomena that is Fifty Shades of Grey? <sighs> yes, I do. Oh, dear. <laughs> I do. Um, there's been... You know, a lot of buzz about this on, you know, people at work talking about it, uh, people on, you know, Facebook, on the Internet, uh, various forums talking about Fifty Shades of Grey. And, you know, the writers, you know, many of the writers, you know, tend to not be as into it as, you know, the uh, general populace. And... You know, I've been looking at the whole picture, and I came to the conclusion that Fifty Shades of Grey, yes, it's Twilight fan fiction, absolutely, and they made a goddamn movie about the books. Mm-hmm, they did, and they made an obscene <laughs> amount of money, more than any of us are going to make in our lifetimes. Absolutely. But, you know, the... The disparaging remarks that I hear about the books and the film come out to, it's fan fiction. Yep, it is. And you didn't write it. So you didn't get fucking dime one. All right? Um, what I find particularly interesting are the, now, mostly female um, respondents saying that this is, a, this is glorifying abuse or this is an abusive relationship and I'm... And I refuse to see the movie because it's an abusive relationship and because I think it's an abusive relationship, you shouldn't see it either. There's that faction, which is not small. And then there's this other faction saying, well, this is not an accurate representation of BDSM. And, you know, I find this offensive. 
All right. Well, and the whole big thing of offense, uh, so fucking what? I, nobody cares if you're offended. It's fiction. It's fiction. It's not a fucking how-to manual. Right. Okay? And it is just some chick rubbing one out at the keyboard as she's thinking of her favorite Twilight characters, and if that's what gets her off... Holy shit, you know what? She connected with somebody because a fuck of a lot of people bought those books, a fuck of a lot of people bought went bought tickets and saw that movie. It is not a goddamn how-to manual. No. I, it is not saying conduct your relationship in this manner. Exactly. It is not saying, you know, that this is how BDSM is. You know what? If some somebody who's otherwise straight up point blank fucking boring ass vanilla goes out, sees this movie and says, "You know what?" I kind of want to tie you up and shove my cock in your mouth. And if they get off on that, bravo, power fucking to them. Why and are you? If they, you shush. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you to get down with your shushness and just shush. Shush. Don't open that. Do not. La. Do not. La. It, it's not supposed to be an accurate representation of anything. It's fiction. It's make-believe. It's made up. Nobody was hurt in the course of writing those books or making that movie. Nobody suffered an abusive relationship. Okay? Nobody is going to take that as a model for what relationships should be. If anything, I think it's more damaging your fucking standard sitcom bullshit fucking parents and kids and, you know, that is a more damaging role model for relationships because it doesn't af that doesn't af reflect reality in any way, shape, or fucking form. And if that's what you're looking for, you're going to be sorely disappointed. All right. If you're looking for just a you know a weekend fuck buddy, you know, okay, you know, you're not going to do too bad by, you know, hey, let's act out you know the the sexual sexcapades of Fifty Shades of Grey, I'm pretty sure that there's a couple or three or a couple thousand right now that has had that thought since this weekend and are having great sex now. Good for you guys. Good for you. Am I, am I still shushed or can I talk now? No, I guess you can talk. My only question was why you were pointing at me when you said straight up vanilla. I wasn't. I was. I'm Neapolitan. Just... <laughs> I'm strawberry chocolate and vanilla. <laughs> now, here, I Let's have. Roll about lying. I have. Make it fucking believable. I have not seen the film. I have no plans to see the film. But I did read the book when it came out because I was told it was, it was really hot. And it was not. Um. But you haven't heard me disparage Stephanie Meyer. You haven't heard me disparage people reading the book. Any book that gets people reading, be it Harry Potter, be it Twilight, be it Fifty Shades of Grey, I'm all for that. I'm for people you know, reading. I think that you know from the uh, bits that I've read, you know, I think that there is definitely some better writing out there. Right. And you know it, that does not seem like something that I personally would be into. The, the so. The one place I would disagree with you, um, I think it's important to note that, yes, some people in the public eye are, are casting the BDSM elements as abusive. And, and BDSM is not abusive if, if no, it's it between isn't. two I mean, consenting that's, adults. That's... However, I think it's important to point out that, that the relationship itself, not the sex, but the relationship outside of the sex... I would consider what he puts her through abusive. Um, but again, it's a work of fiction. People do bad things in fiction all the time. Yeah, but isn't it my understanding that over the course of the three books, doesn't the power of her magic pussy pretty much you know domesticate this guy at the end? I, I haven't read the other two yeah, books. Pretty extra but... special show. That's what happens. Wait, she has a magic vagina too? Cause well, I mean, Kelly Owen told us last. Day. No, Kelly <laughs> Kelly Owen told us last week it was it's just her. Well, really, well, mm. uh, I I wouldn't know about Kelly's vagina, honestly. She's probably listening right now. She probably is. Hi, Kelly. Well, uh, anyway, I, any, no, any I'm final pretty, thoughts? I'm pretty sure that by the end, my understanding is by the end of the three book uh, series that, you know, the, the uh, character um, – Mr. Gray is 
you know, winds up being, you know, a a changed man, not the same man that he was in the in the beginning of the novel. I think that that's the the character development. That's the, the character uh, arc. As yeah, it were. I think that's I think that's the uh, the development and the growth is not so much from the uh, from the woman's point of view, but you know how her attentions and how her affections eventually change the man. And if that's what a woman is looking to do through the course of an abusive relationship, yeah, she's going to be extremely fucking disappointed. Okay? Because, ladies, abusive guys are dicks. Get away from them. Thank you very much. This is a public service message from your Uncle Cook. All right. Well, let's uh, switch gears. Okay. And talk about Richard Lehman. Uh, before we do that, I should mention that this part of the horror show is sponsored by Mike Oliveri's Lie with the Dead, which is book two in the pack series. If you like werewolves or hard-hitting crime fiction, you will love this series. Book one, Winter Kill, and book two, Lie with the Dead, are both available now in paperback, Kindle, and Nook. For more information, visit MikeOliveri.com. That's Mike o l i v e r i dot com. You got anything you want to say about Mike? Hi, Mike. Miss you, buddy. <laughs> All right. Uh, speaking of people we miss, let's talk about Dick Lehman. Uh, I met him in person in '99. I think you met him before that. Yeah, yeah. I I met him in uh, at World Fantasy '98 in uh, in Monterey. That's that's what I met. You actually met Anne, his wife, first, right? Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Um, I was sitting there. That was my that was my first con. I was supposed to go to World Horror that year in Phoenix, but uh, the ex wife, you know, my first wife, decided that she was going to blow up the transmission in in the car, and there went my World Horror fun. So I had to I had to fix the car. So rather than go to World Horror, I went to World Fantasy, you know, out in Monterey, and it was my first con, and I was I was somewhat uh, somewhat overwhelmed. Honestly, I met a I met a lot of people there, you know, for the for the first time, um, and while at the bar, I met this this woman, and you know, she was very cool. You know, I didn't didn't know her anything about her you know she was very cool and you know we were just bullshitting back and forth and she says uh she says to me have you have you met my husband yet and uh, no no i don't i i don't think i have <laughs> and she you know we walk over to the bar she taps him on the shoulder he turns around and there's richard fucking layman did you recognize him right away oh yeah yeah that. yeah yeah um, yeah, I recognized him right away. He was red faced and shit faced, <laughs> and you know it was like, yeah, you know, we it was like, hey, I, I mean, he was just you know friendly, outgoing, warm people, you know, and that was my first impression of the Laymans. Where uh, yeah, I met Anne first, and then and then Dick and Kelly, and uh, you know just wonderful, wonderful people. I. Uh... I met him first online. Now, this was the early internet. Uh, younger listeners out there will have no concept of this, but I'm talking early internet. I was logging on with Windows 3.0 on yeah. a dial-up modem. Uh, but there were, for horror fiction dedicated websites, there were really only four or five. There was horror.net, mm -hmm. uh, horrornet.com, Masters of Terror, Mm -hmm. I think Gothic Net. Well, Masters of Terror and Gothic Net came along a little bit later. A little bit, but a little bit later. Yeah, but um, Layman. Dick, yeah, it was. It was mostly. It was mostly Horror Net. Yeah, Dick was. Uh, he was a member of the the Horror Net chat room crew. That's where I met you and Rain and mm -hmm. Oliveri yeah, and Mikey. Uh, they put up the chat room. Yeah. Uh, after the message boards. Before that, it was just message boards. Right. And. Yeah, and that used to freak me out because Dick and Kelly and Ann, they would all log on with the same Shoo -poo. fucking name. Yeah. Shoo -poo. Yep. It was the same goddamn name. You never knew which one you were talking to. Yeah. And, and <laughs> as a result, and I would, I had no idea what, you know, him and Ray Garten 
both used to be on there. And mm-hmm. I was mortified to speak to either one of them, really. So I just, I believe it or not, back then I was quiet. It would be a few years before. Uh, now, before we, before we yeah, brought but, you out of your shell. Yeah, but then uh, Masters of Terror, uh, they asked me if I would interview him at World Horror 99 in Atlanta. Right. And that was where I met all of you for the first time. Right. But before that, the only person in the industry I'd ever met was Joe Lansdale. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did a signing here in York at the local comic store. And I think our conversation consisted of, oh, my God, you're Joe fucking Lansdale. Will you sign this to Brian? Thank you. Oh, my God, you're Joe fucking Lansdale. Um, but, yeah, I, I you know, I, I, I think it was John Peelan actually introduced me to Dick in person and Ann and Kelly. And we went in this quiet auditorium to, to do the interview. And I asked him one question and then I can just completely went blank. <laughs> because, you know, it, it, I realized, holy shit, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting, sitting here, here with Richard yeah. Lehman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know if you remember this. We did our very first public reading ever at that same convention. It was you, me, Rain Graves, Oliveri, a bunch of other people. And he, sh- I don't think you read, but you were, you were there. You, you, yeah, I was there. And I was saying, I, he, yeah. here's the thing. When you do a public reading, folks, here's a little pro tip. I don't care who you are, unless you are Joe Lansdale, Thomas Monteleone, or Neil Gaiman, Never, ever, ever go over 15 minutes. Oh, God. Because no. after 15 minutes, you, you lose your audience. Well, we were novices. We were a bunch of newbies. And that reading went on for two hours and 45 minutes. Yeah, and was... bless his heart, Dick Lehman sat in the front row for the entire thing. He was patient. Mm-hmm. He was responsive. He was supportive. And as every one of us got up there and read these God awful amateur hour stories. <laughs> I mean, he sat there. He he could have said, you know, I I'm sorry, guys. I have a meeting to go to. I'm sorry, I have to get to another panel. He could have just said, "Fuck you, I'm Richard Layman." Yeah, he no, he, he could have said he, he could have said, you know, I got to go clean that little pan out from underneath the refrigerator yeah. in the hotel in, in my hotel room. But he you didn't. Would have been fine. He he sat there and he supported us through the whole thing. And yeah, uh, no, he that and that. Exactly. You know, that was the, that was just the, the type of guy he was. He, he wouldn't, uh, he, he might not have agreed with you, but he wouldn't necessarily be, you know, he wouldn't be rude about it. Whatever, whatever, even if he did disagree with you and he thought you were a fucking retard, you know, he would not, you know, he wouldn't be rude about it. No. And right now, there's a couple of people saying, I can't believe Coop used the word retard. Oh, my God. Fuck off. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, he was he was kind. You know, like, yeah, he could tell you you were an asshole, but you wouldn't realize that's what he was telling you. Yeah. Because he had a way of putting it. Yeah. But it, he, was, he was also supportive, and that makes me think of the year after that when we were all in Denver for World Horror Con. Mm-hmm. Uh, now you've got this young group of writers. It's you and me and Oliveri. By that time, we'd picked up JF Gonzalez. And, well, you know, I mean, I, well, I mean, I Jesus met, was. But I met Jesus. I, I met Jesus. Yeah, but I, I, he I, yeah. he hadn't been at Harnet until after that. But my point being, Dick goes to this party, private party. Actually, I met Jesus in Monterey. Too. Did you? Yeah, All right. He well, was in Monterey. We the, remember the tour books party. I do. Now, Tor has this this private party in this very posh, very expensive hotel suite in Denver. <laughs> and it's invitation only. And, of course, he's Richard Lehman, so Dick is invited. So yeah. he shows up at the door with all of us until he's like, hey, you guys want to go to a, a Tor Books party? Yeah. And we're yeah, like, yeah. yeah. And so he gets us in. You know, he's like, he's like, these are my plus twelve or however many of us yeah, there were. There was like a, there were like a whole gaggle yeah. of hangers on. We, we, really were. we go in, and you know, we're all a bunch of newbies. We don't know a lot who a lot of these people are. We know who some of them are. Um, some of them already knew who we were, and they were wondering what the hell we were doing there, shooting us daggers. But, yeah, no, it, with the whole the whole tone of the uh, the upper echelons of the tour group that was there. I mean, they they looked at us and it was like, well, 
All right, you guys really shouldn't be here. You know, it, it was like. But uh, you came with layman. You know what? So. It was kind of. You know, it was kind of like it was kind of like uh, when your older cousin goes to college. You know, when you're you know still a sophomore in high school. You know, when he, he brings you up to it. Yeah. You know that that's kind of what it was like. You know, we we really, uh, the reception that we received as a whole was was not warm. No, and sadly. It went downhill from there. I, well, yeah. Five minutes, maybe less than that, after we go through the door, uh, author Ido Van Belkum decides that he has to speak with Dick right that moment about something. And it was very urgent. Yeah. And he kind of took Dick off in a corner. And so we were left to our own devices. Mm -hmm. And we were very uncomfortable. I don't remember whose idea the seance was. Had something to do with uh, Feo. Uh, Feo Amante. He had those damn business cards, and we were like, you know, throwing them all over the right. <laughs> all over the hotel. But uh, yeah, I, I yeah. remember it concluded with uh, you, yep. uh, Michael T. Hike, and myself burning a pentagram in the hotel suite carpet. That's right, because I had that. I had that uh, that like butane jet uh, cigar lighter. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. we all got kicked out, and we, we were did. we were mortified. We thought, oh, my God, we've blown it with Dick Lehman. And I'll never forget this. He said, oh. In they, full disclosure, he might have been mortified. I was giggling yeah. my ass off. I was mortified. And, well, I thought it was funny as shit. You know, we apo I apologized. Because <laughs> you weren't apologizing, I apologized for you, too. And he shrugged it off. Eh, they weren't going to publish me anyway. Or something like that. And maybe they would have. But that was just, that was his disarming, supportive way. Again, you know. Yeah, the four books He could have been telling us we were assholes and he was really well, mad, but we wouldn't have We were. <laughs> we were. And then, uh, I guess it was that same year was KeenCon, was it not? Uh, yeah. that was 2000. Yeah. 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 Now, now, that started as a joke. Uh, I was married at the time and my wife was going out of town for the weekend. And uh, I had posted online, hey, wife's going out of town in a couple weeks. We should have a party. Well, you know, Coop was out in Seattle. He shows up. Uh, Oliveri showed up. Mm -hmm. Feo showed up. He drove from California. Yeah. Uh, uh, Gerard Huarner, Linda yeah. Addison. Gerard and Linda. Uh, and, you know, all these people just start Lee? showing up. Edward Lee. Lee was there? Yeah. Well, it turns out Dick and Ann Lehman were on a, a driving vacation of the East Coast. And he says to Ann, hey, you're, you're, that, you know, that nice little Brian yeah. Keene kid is having a party. We should swing by. And uh, then Kelly flew in. But you, you remember, yeah. I've, I've got this little apartment. Yeah, no, that this apartment you, you guys have to you guys have to appreciate this. The apartment you had almost enough room to change your fucking mind. <laughs> if you really wanted to like consider all the options of whatever it was you were thinking about, you actually had to open up the back porch and go outside because so you would have enough room to consider everything. I mean, it was Literally a fucking postage stamp. Yeah, and we probably had 50, 60 people in there that weekend. But yeah, among them homeless. were, you know, Edward Lee, Richard Lehman. Who, Holly showed up there. Holly, uh, Holly, yep, was, Holly was, she was still Holly Newstein then. That yes, was she was. she married Rick Hodla. Um Brian Freeman, a very young Brian Freeman. He was yeah. maybe still in college at that point, I think. I think he may have been. Yeah, just uh, all Vince Harper, uh, the publisher, he was there. Was, that, was Vince there the Vince, first year, or, the, or Vince, did he show no, up? No, Vince was there the first year. Up, I've got the pictures. Finally showed up at the second one. No, but you have to consider, you know, okay, a lot of you folks out there listening to this podcast, yeah, yeah you've read all my books, you've seen the movies, you listen to the podcast. I was just some dumb fuck kid who had a keg party, and Richard Lehman decided to come by. Yeah. And not yeah. only did Richard Lehman decide to come by, he got shit faced. Oh, he was fucking trashed. The first night, <laughs> the first night, Coop and I got sent to the airport to pick up Kelly because Kelly Lehman decided to fly in and see her parents. While we were gone, Lehman and Ed Lee, they get just hammered. And they decide to go through my library and pull out all of their books and sign all of them. Right. And Lee just wrote the most obscene, funny shit you can think of. I, oh, I... Uh, my copy of Nightbait, Brian, burn this, you fucking <laughs> dickbag or something. Yeah. You know, uh, dicks were all heartfelt 
and funny, and it was very obvious he was drunk when he was signing them. But uh, among those was my my copy of the seller, my original paperback that I got the year it came out. Yeah, you know, I was still a late teenager, I guess. So that was cool. Um, Dick ended up breaking my my grandfather's antique wicker chair, which is like the only thing I had for my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> and he apologized profusely, and you know, I'm fucking honored. Richard Lehman broke this antique chair, but that was that was a great weekend. That was. So you, that, and that was the weekend where when I left, I left my jets out there. Oh yes, talk about this. Oh man. All right, so everybody's uh I'm sure familiar with the gag of the roaming gnome, right? The yard gnome, you know, bunch of drunk kids, you know, take this yard gnome and they run it all over the country and they have a picture of the yard gnome at Devil's Tower or at the Grand Canyon at Whitefish Lake or, you know, the, the Grand Tetons or the Olympics or whatever. Well, my Jets hat <clears throat> took a similar journey throughout the horror genre. Um, I received ransom notes at my house, you know, saying, pay, you know, X amount of dollars or you'll never see your Jets hat again. You know, um, and then I would receive pictures of it. Now, some of them were early versions of Photoshop where uh, people would be posting in, you know, pictures of uh, one person or another. I think uh, Paula Garan was in, you know, that somebody posted that in there. And, uh, and then I got one with uh, Joe Lansdale wearing it. <laughs> and I got one with Bentley fucking Little wearing it. Bentley Little. Yeah, Bentley Little wearing my Jets hat. And, you know, and these, and these pictures would come in from all over the damn country. They were postmarked from everywhere. You know, so I was pretty sure that Brian had something to do with it. And, you know, I, I wasn't... 100%. But I was pretty sure that Brian had something to do with it because, well, you know, I'm being punked essentially, and, you know, I left it at Keen's house, so, you know, he's the first <laughs> one I'm going to be thinking of. But uh, it turns out that this was a uh, ongoing practical joke on me by the laymans. Yep. By, by the laymans. Dick by those Lehman warm, came wonderful, up with it. beautiful people who I love very deeply. They had me going out of my goddamn mind because, you know, have my damn Jets hat. And Kelly actually wrote in to David Letterman. Oh, yes. And said uh, it was like one of those, uh, you know, mailbag things. Hey, you know, my friend Jeff lost his Jets hat at a party by Baltimore. Can you help him find it? And he did this skit did this skit yep. around my jet set like oh yeah you know i've got it yeah i didn't get it back until uh world horror 2001 yep in seattle. seattle yep i didn't get it back until then but yeah i mean uh again just that was that was his sense of humor you know we were talking about world hard denver one thing i forgot that was also the con where dick sold the rising for me before i'd even finished it was that Dick or Kelly that helped sell that? I'm no, pretty sure. I'm well, pretty it, sure it was uh, Layman the Younger. Layman the Younger <laughs> helped, but Dick did the initial introduction. Uh, we went to another party because the tour books party fiasco wasn't bad enough. Uh, the next night, Leisure Books had a party, and uh, we were there. I, I'm pretty sure it was that con. Uh, all I remember is Don Dario was there, and. Uh, Dick introduced me to Don and, you know, said Brian's working on a novel. And, and Don was like, oh, what's it about? And I'm like, well, it's zombies. Don kind of paused and he said, you know, there, there hasn't been a zombie book in a long time. I, I think I'd like to see that. And Dick actually gave me a blurb based on like the first half of yeah, the Yeah, I remember, I remember the blurb. Yeah. I so, do remember the blurb, yeah. But yeah, then the, Kelly helps and yeah, thought, Jack Ketchum negotiated the contract for me <laughs> at the bar. Remember that? Yeah. But, uh, which as I, uh, yeah, 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 I do remember that. Yeah. That was, that was a year later, Don at a, a the horrifying convention in 2001. Yeah. I was saying that was, that wasn't, uh, that was at horrifying the, yeah. that whole bit. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I do. Re I do recall that, you know, when, you know, reminiscing about Dick and, you know, you know, we have these stories and all that and, 
and it's interesting, you know, to to think about. There was he had such a volume of work coming out of the time. Like he wasn't just sitting there, like you know, fucking with me. You know, he's sending me you know pictures of Jet Set. He was also finishing up the Traveling Vampire show. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, actually, I think it was this one right here. Night in Lonesome October. Yep. Yep. Where? Yep. So if you guys have the cemetery edition, uh, cemetery dance edition of a uh, night in the lonesome October with the uh, Alan M. Clark artwork on the cover. You will notice the figure on the bicycle wearing a green hat. Now, Dick told Alan to put the hat in there. Oh, yes. <laughs> Alan's like, I, I, uh, okay. I mean, I didn't really know what he was talking about or why that was so damn important, but, yep, yep. he wanted that in there. And the, so, <laughs> the character in Friday Night at Beast House yes. may have had more than a little passing resemblance to you. Yeah, Broadway Joe. Yep. Dick did that. <laughs> and, of course, uh, my Layman tribute novel, Castaways, uh, there's a character worried about his Jets hat mm -hmm. the whole time. That was my pastiche of that. And uh, not for nothing, wasn't it uh, – didn't it also make mention in, the, uh, in that uh, Michael Slade book? Uh, Michael Slade's – oh. Better, was it Better Nails? I can't remember which of the Slade novels it was, but yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it wound up in there. Yeah. I mean, such and, was the degree to which I'd been punked. And Hacks by Brian Knight, it was in there. Mm. I, I think your hat... My has hat! ...has had more publishing credits than you have, Coop. Huh? Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure it has. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is really, really, really freaking funny now that I think about it. What else do you remember? What else do I remember? Yeah. I mean, like, what's your favorite memory of, of Dick? My favorite memory of Dick? Well, Dick and I, we, we corresponded a lot um, by email. And, you know, my, my I think that my favorite memories of Dick would have been the correspondence, you know, the conversations that we had. Albeit, you know, re, you know, remotely, you know, through the computer and everything. But you know, my my favorite my favorite memories of Dick was, you know, the the correspondence. And if I'm being vague on there, there's, oh, there's I... several thousand good reasons for that. Yeah. But uh, Dick was in many ways a uh, he he was a large part of my life. You know, and he was you know something of and I'm not ashamed to admit it. He is something. He was something of a father figure to me. You know where I not only looked up to him and his body of work and his you know influence you know in the writing in the horror field, but as far as the type of person that he was and the type of man that he was and how he conducted himself throughout you know throughout his life you know has always been a You know, like the gold standard for me to, Absolutely. You know, to hold, you know, to hold myself to. And, you know, those uh, those that know me know that uh, in the years transpiring, I have failed miserably at that. Yep. But, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that the that the idea wasn't there. Uh, just to clarify for you, I don't give a fuck about anybody out there listening right now. We're both a little choked up this second. But uh, when I said, yep, I wasn't agreeing that you're a fuck up, even though you are. I was agreeing that, yep, I always, I mean, okay, Dick is a writer, obviously hugely influential, huge audience. But as a man, as a father, as a husband... You know, him and Joe Lansdale were, they, they very much were the gold standards of, of how you should conduct yourself. And I always thought I would. And I got to tell you, brother, this career is, what, 18 years now? And looking back, I, I failed miserably. I admit it. Uh, I have to think that were Dick around, he'd probably be ashamed of, of some of the things I've done. He'd probably shake his head and in that nice way where he's telling me I'm an asshole, but I don't. Well, you know, I, he, he wouldn't. Uh... He, 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 yeah, I agree with you. 
you know, some of the decisions and the uh, situations that both you and I have gotten ourselves into. Uh, you know, he would uh, he, he would not agree that that was probably the best course of action. No, but but he would have been supportive. Yeah, he yeah. you know he he would have you know it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't have been a, uh, a personal. You know, thing. I don't think. I mean, mm -hmm. he. Oh God. All I, right. I, my favorite memory. It's, it's just a little email, um, and we corresponded a lot via email as well. But it was after he had become president of HWA, and you know, as any professional organization like that is prone to do, you know, that that position came with an amount of stress, trying to make everyone happy, which is impossible. Yeah. And there were some people breaking his balls, and I was young, and I just wanted to go torch the entire place. And he said, "No, no, yeah. you're my secret weapon. <laughs> you wait until I deploy you." And I've always thought of uh, all the cover blurbs and things I've got in my career. That's my favorite, and it's the one I can't use on anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, you're my secret weapon. You wait yeah. until I deploy you. But uh, what's, what's your favorite Lehman novel? It, it, that's impossible. What's your top yeah, three, top my, five? My, my favorite Lehman novel, my favorite Lehman novel, it is actually not impossible. Okay. It is not impossible. It, it's difficult. It's challenging. My favorite Lehman novel is Savage. That would be in my top three. That My favorite Lehman novel is Savage. And I remember, I think it was in Writer's Tale where he goes, you know, Oh yeah, the people that like Savage, you know, you really got to watch out for them. And I was like, what? You know, that, <laughs> good. that was fucking awesome. What are you talking about? But yeah, no, I really, I really liked Savage. Uh, I would say that not. It it is my favorite Lehman novel, probably. Not by a you know a great distance, than you know a lot of his others. You right. Know, I really like The Cellar. I really liked uh, Midnight Tour. I really liked uh, Night in the Lonesome October, albeit, although, you know, my hat was on the cover, so I kind of got to, you know, give that a little nod. The <laughs> Traveling Vampire Show, I like that too. But, um, you know, Flesh, I really like Flesh. Flesh? Yeah. I, uh, for me, Savage, The Cellar, uh, Among the Missing, which I've always thought is one of his most underrated novels. And uh, I think my favorite it's actually not a novel, and it's the hardest of his works to find. Well, maybe not the hardest. I think the romance novels he did under a pseudonym might be trickier to find. But A Writer's Tale, uh, which is part autobiography, saying, part... You know, now, wait a minute. Now, now, don't sit here and pretend like you're going to be... You said novel. You said book. My favorite layman book would have been writer's well, tale. You can you try. You novel. just said book now, motherfucker. I did just say book now. My favorite book is a writer's tale. Yeah. My favorite layman book is writer's tale. Uh, I I cannot stress this enough. If you are a writer, or if you are curious about writers, you need to track down a copy of a writer's tale. Now, it is not as expensive as it used to be. Uh, it's still only available in the secondary market. It, it's not in print. Um, there are rumors that it may be back in print again someday, but right now those are just rumors. Yeah, uh, I would say, well, I mean, you know, who, who, knows, who knows, you know, what the future will bring. But, uh, but Writer's Tale was by Deadline Press. Yes. And, yeah, that was, you know, the, the only addition. It is, you know, and you brought up a good point. You know, it isn't just for the writers. It's for the significant others of writers absolutely you know where or anyone that needs that has a vested interest in understanding the business of writing and all that you know goes along with it you know that is it is uh, an insightful very uh Bold journey. Absolutely. And if you're a layman fan, even if you have no interest in being a writer or, you know, as Warren Ellis puts it, what goes into the sausage, if you're just a layman fan, uh, it's an absolute must read. It's just full of anecdotes and behind the scenes stuff that you would have never known. Yeah. Uh, you, you read a writer's tale 
and you know each novel, everything he ever wrote, there's there's a section in there dedicated yeah, up to, to it. that. Yeah, up yeah. to that point, up to the point of publication. You yeah. know, every every novel, every bit has its own. You know, he has a little little bit of behind the scenes action about it. Yeah, and then when you, you know, when you go was, back uh, and reread those books after reading a writer's tale, I, I think they're better for it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, Def yeah, most most definitely. And in that way, I think that it actually the the uh, the other book that is often compared to is uh, Stephen King's on writing. And uh, no uh, disrespect to Mr. King, but uh, Layman got you on that one, buddy. I, I concur. He, <laughs> he he's uh, definitely got the better yeah. on writing. Better book. On writing is a great book. Uh, David Morell's Lessons from a Lifetime of Writing is a great book. That but is that a is. writer's tale. Yeah, I, I would say. above them both, yeah. you know. I, I would I would definitely agree there. So. All right, well, any final thoughts before uh, we close out this week? Oh, wow, are we already at that time? We are at that time. Well, holy shit. Um, no, I, I mean, I think it's been, you know, it, it's been interesting. It's been fun. You know, I've enjoyed doing this. Have you? Have you yeah. really, or are you just saying No, that? I have. I are, have, because. Are you going to tell me to shush once the microphone goes dead? I'm going to tell you to shush anyway. <laughs> you know, no, the thing is, you know, I, you know, when you announced that you were doing this, you know, I was very, very stoked for you. I was very, very happy to see this finally come to fruition because, you know, it came about and you, and you gave a little nod to it in the first episode with Jesus. All right. It came about with Jesus. You know, this was kind of this was oh, kind of yeah. his idea. Oh yes, it was. This is something that he wanted to do, and um, one of the things that he wanted to do, you know, probably some of the first conversations about what would eventually today in 2015 become the horror show was Jesus and I had the anti readings. Yep. At the horrifying conventions. Right. Now, explain of, explain what the anti readings were. Both Jesus and I hated public readings. Absolutely fucking despised it. And we thought it was uh, more than pretentious and you know, just a dog and pony show that we really didn't want to participate in. Now Brian, being Brian, figured that he would uh, do us a favor by giving us a reading slot. Together. Together. And you know, <laughs> The thing is, he put it on the program, and hey, you guys, I got your reading slot. And we're like, motherfucker, we had no idea. We had no idea. Neither of us had any idea that he was doing this. What, just, did I? Did I have the same shitty, shitty and grin I have right now? Yeah, the kind that where I just want to fucking kick you right in the teeth. Yep, that one right there. So uh, Brian goes and puts us on this fucking reading slot, and we were like, no, no, we're not doing it. And you know what? We ain't going. We ain't going. It'll be an empty fucking room, and, you know, 40, 50 people can sit there and blink at each other for 45 minutes. We don't give a flying fuck. And then it was like, no, nah, no, nah, no, nah, we'll go. But I don't want to read. I don't want to read either, man. All right, so we just went up there and bullshitted back and forth. We talked about current events in the horror genre. We talked about other writers. We talked about the business. We talked about everything. You know, we talked about every goddamn thing. You know, our relationships, our kids. You know how we got it. You know how we got to where we were at the time, because it was mildly, you know, interesting to a couple of people. You know what a big fucking bag of douche Brian was. No, we talked about all oh, yeah. that shit, and the format. Well, kind of became this. Yeah, exactly. And we talked about it afterward. That hey, you know what? You know, it would be cool to do this like as a radio show. You know, if we could find like an AM, you know, or something like that that would let us on or, you know, podcasts really weren't around. And then no. when podcasts came up, you know, first time I heard about a podcast was from Jesus. You know, we talked about it. And, you know, thank you for having me here. Well, thank because you for because, filling in, man. Because being here and being part of this, you know, it is, uh, for me personally, you know, very, very moving to finally have that, uh, you know, ha have a little bit of that back. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I don't know if you remember this. When we first met, I wasn't writing full time. I was still working in radio. 
Yeah. I had no, the morning, I I had that morning show. And yeah. you used to actually call in. Yeah, I called in as an on-air personality. Yeah, I, I would, okay, here's the bit for today. I need you to call in and be this guy. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's kind of I was full living. I, was, I hadn't even moved out to Florida yet. I mean, moved from Florida yet. I was still living in Fort Myers. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, I'm glad you're here. I'm, I'm glad I have this podcast. I, I've talked about it a little in public. Um, you know, I'm, I'm having some health stuff going on. It's not lost on me that, uh, like many in my field, there is going to come a point where I am not going to be able to write books the way I write them now. And, uh, I like this backup plan. I like this parachute, so to speak. Yeah. And you are welcome to come back anytime. Hey, you know, I'll come back anytime yeah. that you guys that you guys will have me. Right, man. You know? I mean, I think you and Dave work well together. I, I wonder how it would work with you, me, and Dave. At I can tell time. you exactly how that would work. I wouldn't get a fucking word in edgewise. That's how that would Oh, work. no. We thought you get in all the words that you needed to. <laughs> and not one more. <laughs> Well, Dave is back next week. Uh, now, many of you out there have been tweeting questions to us on Twitter. So next week, what we're going to do is I'm going to try to answer as many of them as I can in an hour and a half. Uh, the full show will be dedicated to nothing but listener questions. So if there's something you want to talk to me about, tweet us at the horror show BK or leave a comment on our website at the horror show with Brian I do want to mention upcoming guests over the next two months include Jonathan Mayberry, Chet Williamson, Yvonne Navarro, Weston Oaks, Thomas Monteleone, Richard Chismar and Brian Freeman of Cemetery Dance and Paul Gobler of Thunderstorm Books. The Horror Show is available on iTunes, Android, Roku, and all other platforms via Project iRadio. Visit them online at projectiradio.com. Thanks to our sponsors today, Mike Oliveri and Brian Smith. Visit them online. And until next week, fuck you, Rob, Rod Laby or Lab or how? Laby or whatever. What, the what fuck did we decide? Your, whatever the fuck your name is. Douche nozzle. Just die. Yeah, die. Later. Dedicated to geeks and nerds.